as you probably heard, I am sometimes, not often, but sometimes known as the machine. So let me tell you a short story behind why that is the case. So a long time back, um, I started posting content related to discipline on my Instagram. And that's when people started to call me the machine because they're like, and you are doing pretty much the same thing every day. You don't fall off the wagon. So what's, what's the deal? What's the secret? What's the hack? And um, there is no hack per se, but there are some steps that you can take to obviously better yourself to become more disciplined. These are things that I've learned over the past decade. So I tried out lots and lots of things, read a lot of books, but at the end of the day, one main thing that I realized is nothing really happens um, from just reading books unless you actually apply them. You know, discipline is not something that you can just learn from a book. It needs to be experienced. That's how you learn. So uh, basically, I've got a short, well, not a short presentation. It's, <laughs> I would say, medium length. We're going to try to keep it as fun and light as possible for you, but a medium length presentation for you. And we're going to be going through different topics related to health and well-being and also learning how you can get more and more discipline towards any goals. You know, some people maybe want to quit smoking. Some people maybe want to get healthy. Some people maybe want to just develop a better relationship with their parents or spouse. Either way, discipline is a part, should be a part of everyone's life because that's the only thing that can get you from point A to point B without any in emotional interference. So now I'm going to be opening up the uh, presentation. So just give me a moment to share the screen with you. All right, so discipline. We're gonna discuss first, what is discipline? We're gonna discuss how you can build discipline, basically like training a muscle, fostering the right environment for discipline. And then we're gonna talk a little more about well-being and the different aspects. So what is discipline? So a lot of people tell me, you know what? I'm disciplined, I go work out every single day. But discipline really is willingly doing what needs to be done, regardless of your feelings towards it. So why is it not the same as working out every day? Well, if let's say all of your friends are at the gym and you're going there every day to meet your friends, to have a good time and you enjoy working out, that's not discipline. That's just doing something that you enjoy, right? Discipline is being able to do the things that you may not enjoy, but you don't need to get done. I think it's uh, my slide transition game is a bit poor because it's getting stuck a bit. Okay, just a moment. Is there a lag from my end? I feel like there's a lag from my end. I can hear you fine. Okay. Just a moment to fix this. There you go. So like I said before, discipline is not rhetoric. It's not theoretical. You need to experience it. Just like you can't experience how to, you can't experience the fragrance of a flower. You can't learn how to smell and identify different flowers from just reading about them in a book. Similarly, you just can't learn discipline from a book. You need to actually go out and experience it. You can't learn how to swim from a book. You need to actually go out and swim in order to be able to learn. So that's why discipline is an experiential learning. It's not something you can read off of a book and learn. And like everything, you need to first learn how to write an alphabet before you can do poetry. So a lot of people say, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna get disciplined from today. And I'm basically going to work out. I'm gonna quit smoking. I'm gonna have a better relationship with my spouse. And they list 10 things that they want to do. But the only issue is, they've never actually practiced discipline, right? They've never really done something that hard to be able to take such, on such a daunting task. And as a result, they fail, and then they think that there's something inherently wrong with them, but it's not the case. Discipline is a skill. You can learn the skill just by practice, and we're gonna be discussing how. So I'm just gonna show you a video called the Marshmallow Test. So the Marshmallow Test was developed by a Stanford psychologist. So just observe what happens in the video, observe the reactions of the children, and just how they behave and the justifications. All right, so just go through this.
Hiran, there's no audio. It's supposed. Is there supposed to be audio? Oh, okay. Yeah, there is supposed to be audio. You you can't hear it. No, we're just able to see the video. All right. So let me just give you the gist of what exactly is going on, and I'll maybe try to forward it in certain parts. So what she's basically saying is, I'm going to give you a marshmallow, and I'm going to go outside, and when I come back, I'll bring you back two, if you don't eat the one that's in front of you. So if you eat the one that's in front of you, I don't give you an extra marshmallow. But if you don't eat it, I'll give you two instead. So he's talking about how if I wait, you'll give me two for sure. And then she's building that trust. And then she's basically, going, we're going to observe what happens with these kids. All right, so now you'll notice some kids, they're patient, they'll wait, right? Some kids start to play around with the food. This kid straight away goes for a bite. She doesn't care. <laughs> she, she can't hold back because that's so tempting. But if you see the other kids sort of giving her, giving her a reasoning, okay, if you wait, you can have two. But if you don't, if you eat it, then she won't give you any. So slowly what you'll start to see is the kids, their patience starts to wear down. They're starting to maybe reach for it, try to put it in their mouth. It's not technically eating. Yes. They're trying to justify what they're doing. So they'll start playing with it a little bit, smelling it. And then there are some kids, well, they, they don't even want to wait. <laughs> They'll go for the marshmallow. <laughs> they don't even want to wait for the thing to be explained. All right, so what you'll notice is now one of the kids, she's eaten her marshmallow and now she's going out and trying to see whether or not the second marshmallow is coming. Playing with their food. And then most of them start to break down. Some of them start to lick the food. Technically, I'm not eating it, right? I'm just licking it. <laughs> and of course, the ones who waited got the second marshmallow. So the experiment, why was it designed? It was designed to basically see whether or not this is an inherent trait and whether or not this can be trained. The observations of the study were that if there are kids who did not, the ones who did not eat the marshmallow, who got the second marshmallow, later on in life, they ended up becoming more successful. They ended up getting higher paid jobs. Their chances of employment were higher. Their chances of going to college were higher just because they were able to delay gratification. They didn't go in for the instant gratification. They had discipline, right? So when we try to take on a new task, whenever we try to, let's say, for example, smoke, quit, quit smoking, we give ourselves small justifications as to why maybe one cigarette once in a while is fine. It's fine, right? That's not breaking the cycle. But you need to understand if you can really, some, some people are born with it, but it's not something that you can't build. Once you're aware that this is what you're doing, then you can fight it. But if you're not aware, then it's practically impossible for you to actually break the cycle. So awareness is the first key. Okay, so how do you build the discipline muscle? So discipline, um, am I the only one who's getting a yellow streak across my screen? Okay, maybe I am. All right, so this so is getting see. the yellow streak. Yeah, you need to disable annotations from above, or else anyone can annotate. Okay, could you please do that for me? Uh, 
Uh, now you have to do it. I'll do it myself. No, I'm yeah. sorry, I wasn't talking to you. I'll just do it myself. Why? All right, can I please ask the host to disable the annotation? All right, while we're doing that, let's just come back to understanding how we can build discipline the same way we build a muscle. So as you can see, there are two types, two strategies to building muscle. Similarly, there are two strategies to training discipline. One is endurance. So training it like you would an endurance race. And the second is power. So if we're looking at things, discipline activities, which require endurance, these are very, very small activities, such as brushing your teeth late at night, drinking water, laying your bed, turning off the light before sleeping. So smaller activities that don't require a lot of willpower, but can be done frequently. So these are activities that can be pursued alone. Versus if you look at power, these are activities that require a lot of discipline, a lot of willpower. These are life-changing decisions, such as learning a new language, starting, let's say, a new career, smoking, changing your lifestyle, becoming healthy. These are best pursued with a support system. Often what you'll see is people, let's say if you want to start drinking more water, this is an activity that can be pursued alone. However, people usually go around the office telling everyone, oh, did you know I'm, I'm trying to drink more water? And that's really not required because that could be an opportunity for you to seek out help for something bigger, such as learning a language. So we usually tend to swap the two, right? Similarly, if you look at the endurance bit, we can, pursue multiple activities at the same time with minimal recovery time. What do I mean by that? Now, if you're learning a new language, it's best that you focus on taking your willpower and applying that only to one big task. Versus if you're brushing your teeth, let's say you're starting a new habit, hopefully you are brushing your teeth, but let's say you're not brushing your teeth twice a day. In the evenings, you start brushing your teeth, you start drinking water, etc. You can pursue multiple of these small new habits at the same time because they don't require a lot of willpower. Versus if you're looking at something like, like I said, learning a new language, since it requires a lot of willpower, it's best to pursue just a few of them at the same time. Also, between one new habit to the next, let's say I just quit smoking and now I want to change my lifestyle, I want to lose, let's say 50 kilograms. I should ideally give a bit of recovery time before I pursue the next action versus in endurance activities such as smaller habits, not a lot of recovery time is required. So you can just pursue one after the other rapidly without actually depleting your discipline reserves. This is quite simply done because discipline requires energy. It requires emotional investment. So if you take on too much too soon, that can be a problem for you because you're basically draining out your emotional muscle, right? waiting for the next slide to go. Okay, I'm getting a bit of a lag. Just a moment, sorry. Sorry about the technical difficulties, everybody. We have all gone through these online meetings are never getting easy. All right, now let's say you have a goal, right? You want to become healthy, that's your goal. Step one would be to break down what needs to be done versus what you want to do. So let's say you want to exercise. 
what's the antagonist of that? Every time I go to exercise, instead I end up watching Netflix. I want to start eating healthy, instead of that, I start eating junk. I want to sleep on time, instead I start maybe watching Netflix again, right? So you need to identify what you want to do versus what you need to do. So once you've identified that, ask why not. Now it's not about why not watch Netflix, rather it's about why not exercise, right? Or why not eat healthy? So in the moment when I'm looking at, let's say a bowl of pasta, and instead I should be eating healthy. I need to ask myself, why am I not eating healthy? If I'm trying to you know, hit the gym and instead I don't hit the gym, I need to ask why not? And third would be stop lying to yourself and stop bullshitting yourself, stop cheating yourself. Oftentimes when we, let's say, um, lie to somebody else, let's say us, you know, we have to take our kid to practice and we're not able to, and we lie to them. And later on, we feel a little guilty and we avoid repeating that behavior, right? But when we lie to ourselves, usually we completely ignore that. We feel bad, maybe for in the moment, but what we don't realize is what we're doing to ourselves at a subconscious level. What happens is if you keep lying to yourself, if you set a goal, you fail, you set a goal, you fail. Eventually, that's doing damage at a deeper subconscious level because you're, you tend to lose self-respect. Let me give you another example. Let's say you set out a goal and at the end of the day, you achieve your goal. You're going to build self-respect because you, in your own eyes, are someone who follows through on action, right? So stop cheating yourself and maybe, you know, if let's say you have a genuine reason, let's say you want to go exercise, but you have to buy groceries because if you don't buy groceries, well, you don't eat dinner. In that case, no problem. If you can go buy groceries, why not try to walk the entire distance or try to park your car away from the grocery store so that you have to walk a little extra and you manage to find an alternative as opposed to just saying that, okay, this is just not gonna happen today, right? Okay. And number step four is obviously conditioning. So you can't just do something once and expect that to solidify in your mind. You need to do it over and over. That's what's required. So let's say if I set out a goal to be healthy and today I was healthy, great. I ate well, I exercise at the end of the day, you know, a typical Punjabi dinner, you eat healthy in the morning, healthy in the lunch, healthy snack. And for dinner, you have butter chicken. That's not great because that's actually going to break your momentum. So conditioning is required. Ideally to install any habit, you need to, need to be doing it for at least three weeks, 21 days for it to solidify. So conditioning is absolutely important to get you to the next level. Now, building the right environment or the right support system. What you need to do is first of all, identify roadblocks early on. So if you're trying to exercise, for example, and I'm sorry that I keep bringing you back to this example, but it's just that this is so close to me. So it's, it's, it's how I learn. So let's say you want to exercise, you want to make it a routine. You need to identify roadblocks early on. Like I said, if you need to buy groceries, if you have kids that you need to take to school, identify what roadblocks I have, be prepared for them. Number two is have a support system. Like we spoke about earlier, if you're just trying to drink more water, having a support system in that case is not really required. But if you're trying to learn a new language, if you're trying to become healthy, having a support system is absolutely crucial because you need someone to be accountable to, not just yourself. So that if, God forbid, the situation comes where you can hurt yourself, you don't want to hurt another person instead. Next is fail forward. So what I learned over the many, many years that I've been trying to pursue discipline is that a lot of people are start stoppers. They start something and they fail once and then they stop. They start again, they fail once and they stop. What you need to do is you need to fail forward. You need to figure out why I failed. So if it's that, you know, when I started exercising, eventually it took up too much of my time. And as a result, I never went back to it. Well, identify the roadblock, identify what the problem was and find a solution to it, as opposed to just saying that I'm a failure, I can never do this. Because most people end up doing that. And from experience, I can tell you, if you just move past that roadblock, you can definitely make a habit out of whatever you're trying to get into your life. That's how discipline happens. And lastly, chicken or the egg. So do you tackle the physical aspects first or do you tackle the mental aspects? What do I mean by that? Do you force yourself or psych yourself into becoming more disciplined or are there other ways to become more disciplined by preparing the right environment? Well, for me, in my experience, physical preparation is absolutely paramount as opposed to mental. 
there are only so many days that you can wake up in the morning, listen to a motivational video. You can wake up in the morning, think about what actually is get, getting you going or psych yourself into becoming more and more active. At the end of the day, physical preparation is just as important. People don't realize that everything that you think about, the thoughts that you have are just neurons reacting, right? So neurons are physical aspects of your brain. So it's not something that's just happening on a um, you know, mental level or just the software that's going on. If your hardware is not working well, if you're not eating the right foods, you're not having the right movement and you're not having the right sleep, you can't expect to be disciplined because these are things that will throw you off. And now let's talk about how that can happen. So let's get into well-being and discuss how discipline and well-being tie together. So well-being, some people say is a state of comfort. I don't feel it's a state of comfort. Some people say it's a state of happiness. I don't think it's a state of happiness either. It's a state of balance. You see, if you're always seeking comfort, you're speaking from experience. If let's say your entire day is comfortable, right? I wake up in the morning, I have someone to place slippers in my feet. I have someone to make food for me, coffee for me. I don't need to do anything. I have someone to drive me. I tend to be less and less active. And as a result, my discipline also starts to go down. My well-being starts to go down. Because if you're just going to be comfortable all the time, your health will deteriorate. If you're just sitting all the time, your health will deteriorate. So being a little uncomfortable is required for well-being. So it's not being in a state of absolute comfort. Next, happiness. If you're always happy, well, that's not really practical. You can't always be happy. Things will happen in life. Bad things will happen in life sooner or later. So you have to be prepared for sadness as well. So sadness is an absolutely normal part of life. It's an absolutely normal part of well-being as well because you need contrast in life. However, balance, if you can really learn to balance, let's say, sadness and happiness, if you can learn to balance discomfort and comfort, that at the end of the day is what will bring you the best state of well-being. So, what are the aspects of well-being? One is obviously mental, the other would be physical. When it comes to mental, there are a few things that you can do to influence your well-being, such as the content that you consume. Now by content, I don't just mean what you're watching on Instagram. I also mean the kind of people and conversations that you're having, right? Because if let's say first thing in the morning, you're looking at something negative, chances are at least for the next few hours, you will be in a negative mindset. Similarly, if you wake up in the morning and you have a negative conversation with your neighbor, you might get into a negative mindset again. And then secondly, relationships, right? Relationships are absolutely crucial to your well-being as well. As we know, we are social creatures. Human beings aren't meant to be alone all the time. So having a good relationship around you, with the people around you and also with yourself is crucial. And then physical health obviously is required for well-being. So let's talk a little more about mental health. So mental health is all about what you feed the mind. First thing in the morning, the first 15 minutes of your day, what you're consuming versus the last 15 minutes of your day, what you're consuming can influence the state of your day the next day or the same day. So if you really want to influence your well-being in a positive direction, you have got to be careful with what you do, at least what you consume, first 15 minutes in the morning or the last 15 minutes in the day. It ideally would be best if you could do both, but let's say first 15 in the minutes in the morning, if you don't wake up and look at Instagram and look at all the things that everybody else is doing that are great and think about how negative your life is, that would be great for you, right? Instead, if you could just focus on something positive. So if you wake up in the morning, focus on what my goals are, what's right with my life, what, what are the things that I can change in my life in a positive way. These are things that you need to think about and reflect on first 15 minutes or last 15 minutes. I think we've got somebody uh, with their mic on. I could I please request everyone to keep their mics off. Can everybody please mute their microphones? Perfect. Thank you so much. So, we can right. send me a link saying that uh, we'll come back in the evening. Wonderful. Please let Vikram know that we're in the middle okay. of the conversation here. Oh, the numbers are still on the. Oh, it's, it's not on the. I mean, he's not aware of it.
All right. Okay, I think it's been good. No, it's not. Just a moment. Yeah. And by the way, let me tell you, KCP Kimberly Clark, what's the Just a second. It's done within. You can, I think I've muted everyone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I am. Not able to see. My cursor is. Okay. So I am not great with technology sometimes. I am old. Please excuse my um, lack, my lacking ability with technology. Could someone please tell me how to go back on the slides? I'm really struggling here. Are you sharing your screen? I am. Can you just, can't you just go back on screen? Yeah, I don't know. It's not really happening. Come on, Deb. There, yeah. there you go. I need to go back. <laughs> Great. Um, maybe you can uh, stop sharing and resharing again. Okay. Try pressing escape, maybe that would help. Yeah, that's the thing. My escape is not working. There you go. Can you Excellent. use the arrows, the left or right arrows? Is that working? Got it. Or up? I got it. Okay. Thank you. Whoever helped me out, God bless you. Okay, getting the show back on the road. <clears throat> now, where were we? So the content we consume. Next would be relationships. Now, often when we talk about relationships, we think about how our mental health can be affected by relationships outside of us. But we tend to forget about relationships that are inside of us. Single relationship, obviously. How we speak to ourselves. So, for example, if you make a mistake, Often with me, what happens is when I make a mistake, my first reaction is that you're such an idiot. How do you not know how to work PowerPoint? What is wrong with you, right? So at this point, if I speak to myself in a negative way, or like I gave you the example before, if I set a goal and I don't achieve this goal, the relationship that I have with myself slowly deteriorates. As a result of that, I see myself in a more and more negative shade with time. That's why a lot of people with time tend to grow bitter as well. So you've got to be very careful with how you speak to yourself and the relationship you have with yourself. The best way to improve a relationship with yourself is to set a goal, achieve that goal, and in your own eyes, you can see yourself progressing. Obviously, outward relationships are also important. So if you've got a relationship that's toxic outside of you, let's say you've got a spouse with, which, who, with whom you can't communicate properly, that needs to be addressed because that can also influence your well-being massively in a negative or positive way. So try to keep your friends close. Try to keep positive people around you. I mean, this is a little more obvious, but something we tend to ignore. So just be careful with the relationships you have around you. Next would be physical health. Um, physical health can absolutely 110% affect your mental health. People think that mental health is just a software problem but mental health is massively influenced by your physical health as well. Like if you look at the, the point that I made about raw material, literally feeding the mind, every single thought that you have is the result of a neuron connecting with another neuron, right? These neurons are made of protein. So if let's say you have a diet which is lacking in certain macronutrients such as protein, chances are your mental health will be affected. If, let me give you another example, if you drink alcohol, for example, that immediately changes your state of mind, right? Your thought process changes. The way you perceive reality changes. If you drink caffeine, coffee, that also changes your mindset. So why do we then believe that food would not 
change our mindset and mental health as well. So if you're eating foods that don't work well with your mental health, then you are going to have issues. So you need to come to terms with the fact that your food will absolutely 100% affect your mental health as well. And we'll discuss more about how you can influence that in a positive way moving forward. So let's move into sleep. Is it overrated or underrated? So if you're from a similar generation as me, you probably grew up listening to sleep is for the weak. Sleep, I'll sleep when I'm broke, right? So we had this really negative outlook towards sleep. Why do people sleep? You're sleeping, you're so lazy, you're gonna be a bum. But that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. The issue is that we're still in a nascent stage of understanding sleep, but sleep is absolutely underrated, especially in today's world, when it comes to all sorts of well-being, whether it's your food, exercise, uh, your mental health, everything will be affected by sleep. So we literally spend, well, I try to spend at least one third of my day sleeping, right? So if you've got 24 hours, you spend maybe eight hours sleeping. So if sleep was not important, evolution would basically get rid of it, right? Let me give you an example. We had body hair, like if since we've evolved from apes, we had body hair. We didn't need that because we needed to cool down our body. So we got rid of the body hair. So evolution has done everything to keep us moving in the right direction. So why did evolution choose to keep sleep if sleep was something that was not required? So evolution would have gotten rid of sleep because that's the best way to keep the species going. However, sleep is something that's common throughout the animal kingdom, right? Even fish sleep, even dolphins sleep. So sleep is absolutely important. Secondly, sleep is the only time your brain actually cleans itself. So when you're sleeping, that's when all of the um, liquid around the brain flushes out, all of the buildup of the matter that's supposed to be cleaned out. So if you're not sleeping, you're basically not giving your chance, giving a chance to your brain to clean out, do some spring cleaning. And then humans are diurnal creatures, right? So a lot of us like to think that, oh, I love waking up at night and sleeping in the day. Some people can get away with that. But for most people, you're going to be better off if you can wake up in the morning, ideally not afternoon, in the morning, and sleep at night. I mean, it's, it's kind of strange that we're in 2021 and I have to tell people, and like I have to genuinely tell people all the time that you should be waking up in the morning and sleeping at night. But that's something that people tend to ignore. People usually tend to wake up maybe at midday, stay up throughout the night, sleep in maybe 4 a.m., 5 a.m. So as diurnal creatures, we're gonna be at the optimal level of health, optimal state of health, if we sleep during the night, wake up in the morning. And like I said, we're still in nascent stages of discovering what sleep is. So we still don't have all the data, but we have enough to understand that it's important. Now also quantity and quality are equally important. People say often that, okay, I'm sleeping for eight hours a day, still, I don't feel good. What's wrong with me? Well, in that case, maybe the quality of your sleep is not good. Just because you're laying in bed and you're dead for eight hours doesn't mean you're sleeping well, right? Quantity is perfectly fine, but quality could be very, very poor. So what are some of the things that you can do to improve the quality of your sleep? We'll get to that. But before that, let's just understand. So there are different classifications of stages of sleep. I'm just gonna tell you four classifications. So wakefulness, typically not noticeable. Maybe you notice that once and twice in the night you wake up maybe just a little bit and then you go back to sleep. Maybe for a second you wake up and go back to sleep. If that's happening to you, perfectly normal, not a cause for concern. That is going to happen. In fact, maybe throughout an eight hour sleep cycle, you might be up for 40 minutes, right? Small periods of time where you're typically not even light sleep. You're in sort of half wakeful state. But if this is happening too often, too much, then you need to address why that's happening. Too much of any of these is bad. And too little, it can also be potentially bad. Next, light sleep and deep sleep, if you look at that, well, both are physically restorative. So those are, the, those are the stages where your body will repair itself. So if you feel like you're sleeping, but physically you're not feeling really fresh every single day, chances are your deep sleep and light sleep stages are not very long. So you, there are things that you can do to extend these, such as smelling, maybe um, infusing lavender into water and allowing that to spread this, the fragrance to spread in your room, um, things like that to basically physically calm yourself down. And then 
we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. REM sleep, lastly, is the sexy bit of sleep. That's what most people are trying to get because this is what really improves cognitive performance. Memory consolidation, moods, mood, your mood, dream states. This is where basically your brain really solidifies the experiences of the day. So let's say, for example, uh, if you're trying to learn something, if you're really trying to uh, be in a good mood, REM sleep is required. If you're not in a good mood generally, that means maybe you're not getting enough REM sleep. And there are aspects that can um, negatively influence your REM sleep. So let's figure out how now to improve sleep and what are the factors that can affect different stages. Number one is sleep is basically our lives are the dance of cortisol and melatonin, two different opposing hormones. Cortisol is a stress or wakefulness hormone. Melatonin is a relaxation or sleep hormone. So in the morning, let's say you're waking up without an alarm, that's cortisol elevating in your body, which is waking you up. In the evening, when you start to naturally feel sleepy, it's melatonin rising that's making you sleepy. Often in today's world, we do certain things that influence cortisol and melatonin, well, mainly cortisol in a negative way. And that's why we try to manipulate our sleep and we don't get as good quality sleep. So let's figure out why that happens and what you can do to improve it. Number one is light exposure. Like I said, human beings are diurnal creatures. We live, we wake up with the sun ideally. So first thing in the morning, if let's say you wake up and you expose yourself to sunlight, I don't just mean blue light on your phone, but actually sunlight, that can actually release a ton of cortisol in your body, which is required to wake you up. That's why let's say if you're sleeping and somebody draws the curtain, that's a big stress on your body, on your eyes, because naturally it's going to elevate your cortisol. So first thing in the morning, if you can get sunlight, that will be excellent. Also, before sleeping, let's say around the evening, as naturally the sun sets, that's another time when you can get sunlight exposure. So at that time, if let's say you do get sunlight exposure and then you move into, let's say, a darker state, that can also influence your sleep in a positive way because that sensitizes you to, um, let's say, a darker tone. So in the evening, if I've exposed myself to sunlight, now towards the night, when I don't have sunlight, that contrast, that stark contrast is what's allowing me to produce more melatonin. Now, pre-sleep also, we usually get a ton of light exposure. Let's say if you're watching television, if you're looking at your phone, you're looking at the screen, iPad, whatever. If pre-sleep, you're getting sunlight, light exposure, any spectrum of light, ideally blue light should be avoided, but any spectrum of light can influence your cortisol production. So that's why people say you shouldn't look at your screen before sleeping, because when you do get light, that's actually going to elevate your cortisol and as a result, make you less sleepy and your melatonin goes down, your brain gets the perception that it's still daytime and that can negatively influence your sleep. And that's why you should ideally avoid light before sleeping. So as the evening starts to come around, sun starts to go down, ideally get dimmer lights in your house. I'm not saying completely, you know, make it like the back cave or whatever. Um, Batman reference for those who didn't understand that, you basically dim the lights completely. You don't need to do that. You need to dim the lights, but not to the point where you can't even see the floor. That would not be ideal. You can get hurt. So dim the lights a little bit towards the evening and avoid any sort of bright light or on your phone screen also, if you can shift to the night mode where it's a warmer tone, that would also be ideal. Next would be caffeine intake. So caffeine is one of the best ways to spike your cortisol to increase the amount of stress hormone in your body. So in the evening, let's say if somebody drinks coffee, and a lot of people tell me, you know what, I can drink coffee and fall asleep perfectly fine. What you're not realizing is, even though you are, like I said, just sleeping, you're dead for eight hours, doesn't mean you're getting good quality sleep. So if you're having coffee late in the evening, that can elevate your cortisol. As a result, the quality of your sleep becomes poorer over time. So ideally, you want to avoid caffeine, especially if you're very sensitive, at least six hours before bed. If you're not as sensitive, you can even have maybe four hours before bed bed is your last dose of caffeine. I personally stopped drinking coffee completely. And now I pretty much wake up at 5 a.m. without an alarm. And I go to bed around 9, 9.30 without any sort of indication. I naturally dim the lights. I don't need any, any sort of uh, music or anything fancy to put myself to sleep. I've naturally regulated my sleep-wake cycles because I stopped having caffeine. That was a major one for me. Now, food and hydration. If you're eating very, very close to bed, 
what's going to happen is the food will the digestion of food will draw blood into your core whenever your core temperature is higher your quality sleep or quality of sleep will be lower ideally you want to lower your core temperature so if you're eating food right before sleeping that's not great for your quality of sleep also if you're eating something very very sweet before sleeping often times we like to have dessert before sleeping your blood sugars go up as soon as they crash that's when your rem sleep can be very negatively influenced so this is something that i've observed as well if i eat something like watermelon before sleeping even though it's a fruit right you think that it's just natural sugars because the sugars elevate your blood sugar so rapidly and then it dips that's not great for your rem sleep so as a result you might be moody in the next day you might have you know uh, memory issues the next day so ideally you want to avoid things that are very very sweet right before sleeping and lastly there's water so if you're drinking water very close to bed you're probably going to wake up to use the restroom not ideal because that ruins your quality of sleep versus on the other end of the spectrum if you're not drinking enough water throughout the day in the evening you will tend to feel thirsty so you got to make sure around the afternoon is where you get most of your water and slowly start to taper off towards the evening another thing that you can do is you can take a bath before sleeping what that does is it lowers your core temperature because a warm bath will draw water towards your limbs and as a result take it away from your core however if you do a cold bath in the evening that's not great because that will draw blood into your core so you want to take a warm bath before sleeping that will lower your core temperature and obviously the temperature of the room also needs to be considered so anything between 18 to 20 degrees is ideal for sleeping it lower your core temperature and improve the quality of your sleep even if you look at nature in the day usually it's hot in the evening it's cold and that's what works best for our body as well movement and play all right so evolution didn't really design human beings to sit for extended period of time right we weren't designed to just sit all day case in point if i sit on day my back starts to hurt i start to feel old even though i don't think i'm that old but even sitting let's say for a few hours through a presentation can maybe hurt your back so if you want you can move around a little bit loosen up if you're feeling stiff but human beings generally aren't designed to sit for extended period of time periods of time let me give you another example of why movement is so important so the sea squirt if you can see on the screen is an animal that's found in the ocean it has a very interesting life it basically has a brain its objective is to go from one spot to the next it finds a nice place to just be comfortable relax like a couch except in the sea once it finds a place that it finds comfortable it sits there and then it never moves the entire its entire life it eats its own brain right so it goes around finding a nice spot find a nice spot eats its own brain and then it can never move because it's eaten its own brain so that actually made scientists realize that the brain actually develop for locomotion so if we don't move that's actually negatively impacting your brain as well right and then movement is synchronicity what do i mean by that so a lot of times if you're all in your head like you've got too many things going on you're really stressed out too much work going on work tension just going for a walk allows you to become grounded come back to reality reality is perceived through let's say the sense of touch right sense of sight so when you go out for a walk when you exercise when you move is when you can really come back to reality so if you're all in your head and you feel like there's too much going on the best thing to do is just to move and then movement has to be fun too many people say man i get bored in the gym that's why i don't exercise i get bored at yoga that's why i don't exercise it doesn't matter just find something that you enjoy it could be a sport it could just be playing with your kid it could be playing with your spouse let's not go there but the idea is that you basically want to find something that's enjoyable so that it's you're actually looking forward to doing it and lastly stimulate don't annihilate so a lot of people do crossfit workouts these days they're very popular they go to the gym they exercise they completely destroy their bodies and then come back and then they can do that five days six days they're dead they can't move. and then they say crossfit is not for me i got injured this happened that happened in order to be healthy you just need to stimulate your muscles you don't actually have to go to the gym kill yourself you don't have to go to a basketball game and completely lay it out on the court just have fun with it stimulate don't annihilate now training goals ideally this is a list 
to understand what primarily should be your training goal and moving down, you can understand what, can, what is less important. Range of motion is essential. What I mean by that is the ability to, let's say, move your arm all the way back, scratch your own back, right? The ability to sit into a deep squat is what is paramount for health, well-being in terms of longevity. So if you want to be 90 years old and still be mobile, not require assisted living, range of motion should be your first and primary goal. So whenever you're doing any sort of exercise, just make sure you're going through the full range of motion. I see some people in the gym, they're doing shoulder presses like this. Not a good idea. Go through the full range of motion. You're doing yoga, that's excellent for range of motion. So pick activities that allow you to move and stretch and be dynamic. Number two would be cardiovascular health. Um, heart disease is probably one of the leading causes of death all over the world. So cardiovascular health is absolutely essential for well-being. Many people just go to the gym and they work out, they pump up their muscles, but they don't focus on cardiovascular health. You have to focus on just moving, allowing your body to be in a rhythm, and that's what's going to improve your cardiovascular health. So just go for a walk if you don't like running, or run if you don't like walking, but find something that allows you to develop a rhythm that is extremely important for well-being as well. Next is reflexes. So playing a sport is excellent for developing your reflexes because as we tend to age, we slowly you know, dull down our reflexes. You've got to be careful with, well, not having the right reflexes later on because that could be the changing point in your life. What do I mean by that? So let's say if um, somebody opens up the door for you and you're not able to react, that door can slap, on, slap you in the face. Or there are lots of situations where your reflexes can save you. But if you don't practice it, you lose it. You don't use it, you lose it. So train your reflexes by playing a sport. Coordination and balance are important for longevity as well, because when we start aging, a lot of people, you know, they don't have good balance, they break their hip, they break their hip, and that's what's maybe, you know, the downfall that's happened in my family as well. My great grandmother, that's how we lost her. Break your hip and then you're gone. So coordination and balance is absolutely important when it comes to good health and longevity. With that, you know that even in a later age, you don't require assisted living. And that ties in with muscle mass and strength as well. If you don't have muscle later in age, later on when you grow older, things like even getting up out of the chair are challenging for you. So you've got to make sure you develop muscle mass and strength by at least going to the gym once or twice a week, doing a little bit of strength training, simple routine, it doesn't have to be elaborate. You can just sit on a chair and get up. Something as simple as that can help you maintain muscle mass. And then lastly, you can chase metal and you can focus on performance. So a lot of people start with, okay, I'm going to run a you know, marathon. That shouldn't be your primary goal. That can be your final goal. And then we've got under overtraining. Overtraining has two aspects. Either you're doing under recovery or you're overshooting your capacity. What do I mean by that? So let's say if you can only lift 50 kgs, People go to the gym and lift 100 kgs because ego, right? They want to be better than the next guy. That's not ideal because that can lead to overtraining. But more importantly, if you're just not sleeping, you're not eating right, that can lead to under recovery, which is more the case for most people compared to overtraining by overshooting their capacity. So these, this is just an overview of what you should be doing in terms of training. But what I want you to learn from this, the takeaway would be just find something that you enjoy and do it for a minimum daily time. So just go for a walk for at least 30 minutes a day, right? Play a sport twice a week. Just do something that you enjoy. Now, nutrition. So in the words of uh, Olivia Newton-John, I don't know, maybe you guys are too young, so you haven't heard the song, let's get physical, physical. But like, I love that song. In terms of nutrition, that is completely applicable. Like you could, you couldn't, practice nutrition by reading a book, you have to be physical about it, just like discipline. So what do I mean by getting physical? Well, personalized nutrition, let's understand that. What works for me might not work for you. So brain, my neighbor did a vegan diet. She feels great. My other neighbor did a carnivore diet where he's just eating meat. He feels great too. What should I do? What's the best diet? There is no best diet. The best way of eating is personalized nutrition, feeling what works for you, all right? So everyone is going to have a different set of things that work for them, different kinds of foods that work for them. So find out what works best for you 
by experimenting and logging your food. So also understand that evolution is what dictates what food works for you and what doesn't. Let me give you an example. People in Japan don't do very well with dairy because they have never consumed dairy in their past. Versus people in North India do really well with dairy because their ancestors have consumed dairy. Maybe some people in South India can't have dairy. They have lactose issues because their ancestors never had dairy. So find out what your what is ancestrally appropriate for you and stick to that. That will, in my experience, be the best bet for you, the best diet for you. Also, a lot of people these days say, you know, meat is bad, fruits are bad, this is bad, that is bad. Humans have been eating fruits for millions of years. Humans have been eating meat for millions of years. So it's not that meat is bad, fruits are not bad either. So find out what is evolutionally consistent. So if humans have eaten meat, it can't be bad for you. So think from that perspective and you'll start to see what works for you and what doesn't. And then what works best for your gut is the food that works best for you. So if you're eating Rajma Chawal and you're a gas bag, you could play a trumpet because your stomach is completely bloated. That's not good for you. Simple, right? Versus if you're eating maybe even garlic and that bloats you up like crazy, avoid garlic. So experiment and notice what works for you from a digestive perspective. Usually things that you can digest well without any symptoms are the best things to eat for you, right? And then why do we experience cravings? Cravings usually happen because you're not able to meet your nutritional needs, right? So let's say if your blood sugar is going down, you're going to crave something sweet. Similarly, the protein leverage hypothesis basically states that if you're not eating enough protein in your diet, usually you'll tend to feel more hungry. So ideally, if you're having higher protein foods and enough of those, you would not feel hungry because you're meeting your nutritional requirements. Similarly, with let's say micronutrients, if you're always hungry and you notice that, man, my vitamin A levels are crap, my vitamin C levels are crap, my vitamin D levels are crap, well, then you need to have foods that have that nutrition. And as a result, you start to notice that you feel less and less. You have fewer and fewer cravings because cravings are just a mechanism for your body. It's, it's a mechanism of your body telling you that something's missing. So if, let's say, lastly, if you're always chasing sugar, you're always craving sugar, one issue that you might have is cortisol. You might have a cortisol issue in the way that if you have too much cortisol, you're going to burn through the blood sugar, right? So whenever we have elevated blood sugar, Whenever we have elevated cortisol, as a result, we usually have lower blood sugar because cortisol burns through sugar. So if you're always craving sugar, try to de-stress a little bit, have something like ashwagandha that can probably help you manage your blood sugars and try not to have things that spike your blood sugar, like sugar, plain sugar, because that can also mess with your craving. And lastly, just to wrap this up, the essentials of nutrition. So I'm not gonna complicate this too much, there are three basic things that you can eat in nutrition, proteins, fats, and carbs. Proteins, important. You have to have them. They're the building blocks of life, the most important nutrient. Fats are also required because that's what builds hormones in your body. Carbohydrates, there are no essential carbohydrates. You can ideally live without carbohydrates, but they're a great source of fuel. And let's be honest, they taste great as well, right? Everyone likes a bowl of pasta. So, Try to prioritize protein whenever you're eating. Have enough healthy fat. I'm not saying stay away from fat. Have enough healthy fat. And then use carbohydrates as a source of fuel. So earn your carbs. So go out for a walk, go out for a run, and eat carbohydrates. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't do any of that. Oh, I'm going to skip carbohydrates for dinner because my dietitian told me to do so. You don't need to skip carbohydrates. Carbohydrates can be part of a healthy diet as well. And my micronutrients are also what are required in order to have good health. Don't want to dive into that too much but in today's world we know that things like vitamin c are absolutely essential for your immune system vitamin e vitamin d so it's always great to get these levels checked by just doing a simple blood panel test if you feel like any of these micronutrients are missing either you supplement or eat things like let's say dairy eat eggs which are packed with these sort of micronutrients so try to get most of your nutrition from food if let's say in your diet you're not able to get your nutrition you have to supplement supplement but ideally, if you're eating a healthy diet, you don't really need the supplement. So let that be a guide for you. So I think uh, that would be the end of my presentation. Um, maybe if somebody has any questions now, we could open the forum up.
for questions. Thanks, Ranjan. I think that was super informative. Uh, it's amazing how little we um, know about our bodies. I mean, not speaking for everybody, of course, uh, but 